News of the Times William Boosfield, The Family Murderer and the Botched Execution In today's episode, we turn to 1856 and the case of William Boosfield, who killed his wife and three children with a chisel and a razor. As terrible as his crimes are, the story that is most remembered with William Boosfield is the highly botched execution attempt by Calcraft, where he, Boosfield, manages to resist the same execution no less than three times before being launched into eternity. We hope you enjoy the show. From the Reynolds newspaper, the 10th of February, 1856. Horrible murder of a wife and three children. A horrible tragedy was perpetrated early on Sunday morning. The murderer, whose name is William Boosfield, is about 37 years old and resided at 4 Portland Street, where was kept a small but very respectable cigar and newspaper shop. He had been married several years, and his wife had borne him three children. Being an only daughter, she was much beloved by her father, Mr. Jones, a man of some property. He, the father, Mr. Jones, lived in the house where they resided, the shop and parlour of which he allowed them to occupy rent-free. The unfortunate wife was a very industrious and persevering woman and paid great attention to her little business, which, under her management, was progressing very favourably. Lately, the murderer William Boosfield had been jealous of his wife, but it is said without the slightest cause. Matters at one time became so unpleasant between them that Boosfield was offered by Mr. Jones a sum of money to enable him to go to America if he would leave his wife behind, but he refused. His jealousy appeared to increase, and it is believed he then formed the determination to commit the horrible crime, which he unhappily too successfully carried into effect. About twelve o'clock on Saturday night week, Mrs. Boosfield closed her shop, at which time the husband was at home, and, what is most extraordinary, not the least noise was heard during the night by the persons living in the house. About six o'clock on Sunday morning, the murderer presented himself at the Bow Street police station and informed the constable that he had murdered his wife and family. He was taken to the inspector on duty to whom he repeated the intelligence. The inspector at once dispatched some men to the place mentioned and found the prisoner's statement confirmed. It has been stated that Boosfield was a, by trade a carpenter. This appears not to have been the case, since at an early age he was taken in hand by a solicitor well acquainted with his father and introduced into the office as the office boy. By good conduct he rose to the favour of his employer, who made him one of his clerks, but according to a statement made by himself to a friend, dismissed him summarily from his service because he got married without giving him any intimation of his intention. Deprived of his situation as a clerk, Boosfield endeavoured to obtain other employment in the same capacity, being for some time unable to succeed. He determined to qualify himself for obtaining a livelihood by manual labour and paid a premium for the purpose of being taught the art of French polishing. Having, as he supposed, become a proficient in this, he sought work in the usual way by going from shop to shop, sometimes getting a job, but much more frequently making his round of applications in vain. 
as his earnings were insufficient for the support of himself and wife in a respectable manner, a tobacconist's shop was fitted up by his father-in-law so that his wife might be able to add something to their income. After this, the employment at the French polishing appeared to become more difficult to obtain, and Boosfield looked about for some other occupation. At length he got upon the stage as supernumerary at the usual low rate of wages, and remained in that capacity at the Princess's Theatre up to Christmas last. He then applied at Covent Garden, which Professor Anderson was about to open, and being engaged, figured in the pantomime as what is technically termed a young man, ranking one step higher than a mere supernumerary, and increased his wages some six shillings per week. He is described by those who knew him well at the theatre as having been an exceedingly civil but at the same time an extremely taciturn man, seldom speaking except when first addressed, and then as briefly as possible. He is also said to have been a man of strictly temperate habits, and even quite unaccustomed to smoking out of his own house. At the same time, he appears to have possessed little energy or perseverance, and this fact, may possibly account for the charge of laziness brought against him by some who alleged that he cared to seek for no employment beyond that at the theatres. It appears to be a matter of certainty that the ill-fated pair for some time before the murder had led a life of extreme unhappiness, so that their domestic quarrels formed a subject of almost daily gossip amongst the neighbours. With regard to Saturday itself, the evening previous to the murders, a theatrical supernumerary, well acquainted both with Boosfield and his wife, living near the spot, stated that he was in the shop about half past five in the evening and that Boosfield had and his wife were then quarrelling as was almost always the case whenever he entered the house. He recommended them, as he had often done before, to leave off quarrelling and become good friends, but he had not the slightest idea that there was anything more serious than usual in their misunderstanding, which appeared to have arisen from jealousy on Boosfield's part. On Saturday, he left home at the usual time, fulfilled his accustomed part in the pantomime at Covent Garden, passed the evening without anything of an extraordinary nature exhibiting itself in his deportment, returned home without delay at the conclusion of the performance, went out to fetch some milk, and was not again seen until he presented himself on Sunday morning at the Bow Street station. Committal of the Prisoner On Monday at Marlborough Street Police Court, William Boosfield, described as a French polisher living at 4 Portland Street, Soho, was charged with the murder of his wife and three children. The prisoner is a tall, gaunt man, about 37 years of age, of shabby and dissipated appearance. Although his acquaintances state that he is a man of temperate habits, the prisoner appeared to be unconscious of what was passing around him and maintained a gloomy, imperturbable silence throughout the proceedings. He was allowed to sit in the dock as he appeared or pretended to be too weak to stand. He refused to make any reply when asked for his name. The first witness called was Constable Fudge, 68F who, on being sworn, said, A little before seven on Sunday morning I was on duty at the station house in Bow Street, and I was standing in the passage when the prisoner came it to the door and walked in. I asked him where he was going, and he replied, I'm going in here. I asked him 
What for? He said, to give myself up for murdering my wife. I asked him where, and he said, number four, Portland Street, St. James's. I then took him to Inspector Dodd, who ordered me to search him. Inspector Dodd from F Division deposed. About seven on Sunday morning, the third inst, the prisoner William Boosfield came to Bow Street Station and on being shown in to me said, I have killed my wife. I said, What do you mean? Where is she? The prisoner said, In the back parlour. I asked him where he lived. He said, Number four, Portland Street by Waldorf Street. I ordered him to be searched, which was done by the last witness. I found a wound on the prisoner's cheek covered with blood, and a cut on his left hand also covered with blood. I sent for the divisional surgeon to dress his wounds. A latch key was found upon him, which I took and went in a cab to the prisoner's lodgings, and with the latch key I opened the front door and went in, and broke open the back parlour door, and there found, on a French bedstead, the dead body of the prisoner's wife, Sarah Boosfield, said to be twenty-eight years of age. She was lying on her back with her head on the left side and a large cut on the neck under the right ear, covered with blood. I sent last witness for Dr. Hadaway at number 36 Berwick Street, and he attended immediately. I also found on the same bed the dead body of a child named Elias, about four years old, with its head toward the foot of the bed and her right knee close to the right shoulder of the body of the woman. I found a wound on the child's neck and she was covered with blood. I also found the dead body of a male child about six months old and another about six years old, each with a wound on its neck. I also found a five-eighth chisel covered with blood which I produce. This I found on the pillow of the French bedstead and close to the dead body of the woman. I also found part of the handle of a razor smeared with blood under the left shoulder of the dead body of the woman. Under the body of the male child I found the blade of a razor covered with blood. I also found between the dead bodies a piece of leather. The bed and bedclothes were saturated with blood, and a great quantity of clotted blood was on the bed and floor by the bedside, and spots and smears of blood on the floor from the beds into the shop. I traced the blood from the beds into the shop through a glass door. There was blood also on a key in the shop door, and blood was also on the door and doorposts, as if some person had gone out with hands covered with blood, the blood being quite wet when I saw it. I also found blood on a slate book on the counter. I secured the place, took away the keys, and went back to Bow Street. I saw the prisoner and told him he stood charged with the willful murder of his wife and his three children, and the prisoner said, That's all right. I have since ascertained from persons who lived in the house that they could assign no motive for these murders, unless it was that his wife was constantly reproaching him for being out of work, and that he had been out of work almost constantly for the last seven years. John Jones number four portland street carpenter deposed i live at number four portland street in the same house as the prisoner who is my son-in-law he having married my daughter the prisoner and his family occupied the shop and parlor the prisoner had a wife and three children in the shop stationery toys tobacco and sweet stuff were sold 
The prisoner's wife constantly attended to the business. The prisoner was out three parts of the time doing nothing. The prisoner sometimes got employment as a supernumerary at a theatre, earning sometimes a shilling and a one shilling and sixpence a night. This I heard from my daughter. They lived together upon pretty good terms until the birth of the third child, and then words sometimes occurred in the consequence of the prisoner not going out in order to get something to maintain his family. The last time I saw the prisoner and his wife together was on the morning of Saturday last. They then appeared to be amicable and quite comfortable together. I didn't hear any of the quarrel or misunderstanding on Saturday last. The Christian name of my deceased daughter was Sarah. Of her eldest child, Anne or Annie, the name of the boy was John William. Witness Jones, father of the deceased Sarah, went on to say, I have paid house rent, doctor's bills and other expenses for the family. I put them into the business on Portland Street and I had no idea of what had been done until the police informed me of it. I slept in the first floor of the same house and didn't hear any noise or any single thing to excite suspicion during the night of Saturday. Mr. James Hadaway, 86 Berwick Street, surgeon, spoke to the nature of the wounds which he found upon the deceased and which he believed to have been produced by the chisel and razor found by the police. Police Constable Ferris, F88, deposed, I had charge of the prisoner yesterday morning from a quarter to seven o'clock until about eight o'clock. I had hold of his wrists while he was being searched. The prisoner threw himself forward and tried to hit his head against the mantelpiece, crying out, Oh, kill me! Out of the way! He then added, Fetch a doctor to my poor wife. And after that, the divisional surgeon came and dressed the prisoner's wounds. The prisoner said nothing more, except to express a wish to be allowed to go into the cell. Mary Ann Bennett, number 4 Portland Street, deposed, I occupied the second floor back room, and about half past twelve o'clock on Saturday night, I rapped at the parlour door occupied by the prisoner to ask for some wood which was sold in the shop. The wife answered me in a most cheerful voice that they were in bed and that the wife spoke to the prisoner who was in bed to get the wood. The prisoner did not rise. He only muttered something which I could not hear, as I was outside. The wife, however, said she would be up by six o'clock the next morning. The prisoner, who said he had nothing to say in explanation, was then committed for trial. Inquest on the Bodies on Tuesday, an inquest was held on the bodies, and the prisoner not being present, the evidence given was merely a recapitulation of that reported above, with the exception of that of Mary Ann Bennett living in the second floor back for Portland Street, where the murders took place. She deposed that she had been there for two years, and at times they had words, principally through his being out of employment. On the Saturday evening at half past twelve, witness rapped at the parlour door and said she wanted two bundles of firewood. Mrs. Boosfield replied, We are in bed, and said to her husband, Will you rise and get it? Witness did not hear his answer, but Mrs. Boosfield, in the most cheerful voice, said, I will leave it at your door at six o'clock in the morning. Witness did not know of any late, later quarrel. They had not slept together for eight months until Tuesday night last, when they made a change and slept in the same bed. Witness knew that Boosfield was jealous, but it, without cause. Witness had often heard 
him say, within the last fortnight, and especially on Tuesday last, that she made too free with the customers. He did not like her to speak to the young men who came into the shop to buy cigars. She was a very pleasant woman in the shop, and many people would buy of her and not of him. Mrs. Bruceville said one night, He is not here tonight, when all at once he popped in and said, Oh yes, here he is. He was jealous of all. It was on Friday evening he came in unexpectedly. He had done so before. Boosfield was pretty fond of his children, but not excessively so. Inspector Dodd stated that he had an actress present who could prove that the prisoner left his employment at the theatre earlier than usual on Saturday night. But the coroner stated the jury decided that further evidence was quite unnecessary. The coroner then summed up, and the jury, without hesitation, returned a verdict of willful murder against William Boosfield. The trial was an open and shut case, and was not followed with any great measure by the press. William Boosfield was found guilty and sentenced to death. Requests for a commutation to life in prison were denied, and with the sentence of death penalty to be carried out. What did cause a sensation was William Boosfield's execution. From the Daily News, London, 1st of April, 1856. The execution of William Boosfield. Yesterday, William Boosfield, the murderer, publicly executed in front of the jail of Newgate. It is being generally known that all attempts had failed to obtain a remission of the sentence from the Secretary of State, and that the execution would certainly take place yesterday. All the usual preparations were made, and during the night groups of persons continued to assemble in front of the jail. Long before the fatal hour, the crowd had increased to between four and five thousand persons, nearly all of whom were of the wretched class, who are notoriously the constant attendants upon such scenes. Boosfield was convicted at the last sessions at the Central Criminal Court for the murder of his wife, Sarah Boosfield, aged 28, and their three children in Portland Street, Soho, under circumstances of peculiar atrocity, the only assignable motive being unfounded jealousy. Since his conviction, the prisoner persevered in maintaining a sullen, morose and dogged demeanour, pretending at times to have no recollection of the murder and that the whole thing was a dream to him. All that could be got from him was, pray, don't talk about it, it is a horrid dream, and to a great extent he succeeded in inducing the officials to believing his statement. It soon, however, became apparent to them that the condemned man was endeavouring to throw them off their guard, and that the whole of his movements were assumed to awaken some interest in his situation. So apparent was this that the jail authorities and those whose duty it was to watch him became more vigilant. He, the prisoner, all along declined to receive any religious instruction or consolation, and wrote a letter to the father of his murdered wife in which he charged that unfortunate woman with having committed adultery stating that the female lodger who was examined on the trial aided her in it, and that two of the children had told him a young man was in the habit of kissing his wife, which aroused his jealousy, leading to the fatal act. On Saturday he was visited by the sheriffs, and was told he must prepare to undergo the extreme penalty of the law. He made no reply, but exhibited the same sullen and morose conduct which had characterised him throughout. 
At about 12 o'clock on that day, his two sisters took their final leave of him. They appeared to be respectable women and exhibited much distress, but the prisoner, even with them, was impassive. At about four o'clock in the afternoon of Saturday, the condemned man was sitting at the foot of his bed, facing but at some distance from the fire, apparently in a low and despondent state, watched by the turnkey, when suddenly he rose from the bed and threw himself, head foremost, onto the fire, then burning in the grate, his entire head from the chin being placed over the top bars. The turnkey immediately rushed upon him and forced him back, but not until the lower part of his face and neck were much burned from his neckerchief having caught the flame. Mr. Gibson, the prison surgeon, was on the spot immediately. The burns, however, proved not to be of a dangerous character, but in a short time, from the livid and swollen appearance of the face, he became a hideous spectacle, apparently helpless and almost lifeless, and from that hour to his death he continued in the same state, never uttering a word and taking for sustenance only a little milk and wine. During the whole of Sunday the wounds were constantly bathed and lotions applied, and this in some degree reduced the hideousness of his appearance. Early on Monday, Mr. Alderman Sheriff Kennedy and Sheriff Rose, with Mr. Stone and Mr. James Anderson Rose, the under sheriffs, arrived at the prison, and at a quarter to eight o'clock they proceeded, accompanied by the Reverend Ordinary and Mr. Weatherbed, the governor, to the cell, where the wretched man was sitting, or rather, held on a chair. He was in a state of apparent frustration and helplessness, supported by two assistants, a third constantly wiping a frothy fluid from his mouth. He exhibited no consciousness of what was taking place, but appeared to be in a dying state, his limbs refusing their office. That this was feigned, his conduct at the last moment renders more than probable. A few minutes before eight o'clock, Carl Craft was introduced into the cell and immediately proceeded to pinion his arms. At this time, the prisoner appeared in such an exhausted state that Mr. Sheriff Kennedy desired Mr. Gibson, the surgeon, to examine him. This he did and reported that his pulse was very low, but that the arteries were active. It being now eight o'clock, the signal for the procession was given. The prisoner to the last exhibited all the helplessness of death. No inducement could succeed to make him stand, although raised up and supported, and it became apparent that he must be carried to the place of execution. Two men took hold of his legs, and the two supported his shoulders, and in that state he was conveyed to the foot of the scaffold. The sheriff and under-sheriffs preceded him, the Reverend Mr. Davis reading the burial service, and the prison bell was the signal to the crowd that the execution was about to take place. On arriving at the foot of the scaffold, a difficulty arose as to the means of getting the convict under the drop. At last it was suggested by some of the officials that he should be placed on a chair and in that manner carried on to the scaffold. A high chair of the governor's office was obtained, and upon this the prisoner was placed and conveyed thereon by four men up to the scaffold the chair being placed under the fatal beam. Calcraft, who appeared in a state of nervous terror, lost no time in putting on the cap and adjusting the noose. As soon as he had fastened the hook to the chain above, 
he ran down the steps and withdrew the bolt, the chair and the convict falling at the same time. Attempt one. Scarcely two seconds had passed before the wretched culprit exhibited a power and strength truly astonishing to those who had last seen him but a minute before. He raised himself upward by sheer muscular strength and succeeded in placing both of his feet on the right side of the scaffold and in that position supported himself for several seconds. Attempt 2. Calcraft, having disappeared the moment he had withdrawn the bolt, one of the turnkeys ascended the scaffold and threw off Boosfield's legs. When he, Boosfield, dropped once more, the yelling of the crowd was terrific. Attempt 3. Again the convict struggled and again succeeded in planting both feet on the left side of the scaffold. The sheriffs were horrified, and Calcraft, being brought back, withdrew the legs, and for the third time the body fell. Yet life was not extinct, for in a few seconds, for the third time, the convict succeeded in planting both his feet on the right side of the, the scaffold. The cries, hootings, and yelling of the crowd became frightful. Attempt 4 Again the legs were withdrawn and the body for the fourth time suspended, when, by the legs being secured, after a fearful and convulsive struggle of several minutes' duration, life ceased to exist. In explanation of the conduct of Colcraft, it is stated that he was under some apprehension of personal violence, having on Saturday last received a letter in which he was warned to obtain from the horse guards a helmet to wear on the occasion, as it was the determination of the Kent Street roughs to shoot him, to put an end to any more executions. This silly epistle alarmed Calcroft, who showed it to the Governor and the Reverend Mr. Davis. They endeavoured to point out to him the folly of exhibiting any fear, as Mr. Davis was in yet greater danger as he remained longer on the scaffold. But Calcraft was by no means satisfied that some mischief was not intended against him. An extra body of police was present, a strong body being placed within the prison. But it is almost unnecessary to say no attempt at violence was made by any of the crowd their manifestation being confined to shouting and yelling at what appeared to them some negligence in prolonging the sufferings of the murderer. The Aftermath The botched nature of the execution raised eyebrows and questions. It was even discussed in Parliament. Had Calcraft's disappearance down the stairs been due to the threatening letter he purported to having been received, or was this his normal routine of running down the stairs to swing on the legs of the prisoner? If he had indeed received a threatening letter, why was the governor not informed before? The executioners always arrived at least the day before. The additional prison guards mentioned would have been normal for an execution for crowd control, it is a question that remains. That concludes this episode of William Boosfield, The Family Murderer and the Botched Execution. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe and tell your friends. Subscribing really helps us. We're aiming for a thousand subscribers. If you have already subscribed, our sincere thank you for your support. We very much appreciate it. We Upload content daily with longer episodes four times a week. Tuesdays, an in-depth look at the case known in its day. Wednesdays, recounting the build-up to the Ripper murders in, in Whitechapel Wednesdays. Thursdays, a collection of stories based on the theme and our serial killer Saturdays. With shorter, but we still believe 
interesting stories uploaded on other days of the week. For our podcast listeners, you can see this podcast with the associated pictures on our YouTube channel at News of the Times. You can find the link in the show notes. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.